I would like to ask Pastor to start with a prayer, and then we'll uh, move on with the uh, lesson. Our Father, the truths that we have just sung in this hymn are both exalting and they're very humbling. Mm. We, we thank you that you will, <coughs> you will con continue and carry on the work that you've begun in us, that you will enable us to run the race that is set before us with our eyes fixed upon Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. We, you will continue that work that you've begun in us but Lord, we're also reminded that we're often resistant to that work. We're yeah. often wayward and wandering. Mm -hmm. And Lord, we, we thank you for the rescuing grace that has first saved us. We thank you for that repeated rescue along the Christian uh, road that when we walk away, you bring us gently uh, back to yourself. We, our hearts are prone to wander. They're prone to leave the God we love. And even now, we would pray that you would take and seal them, and seal them for your courts above. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> um, with today's uh, lesson, uh, we'll be finishing up with uh, this, not the chapter, but at least like this section of the, of the chapter, of chapter 26 of the church. Um, and there's three paragraphs. Um, one of which we, we kind of address a little bit, so we're not going to be focusing as much, but uh, we're still going to address it briefly. Uh, the three paragraphs are paragraphs 9, 10, and 11. Chapter, uh, chapter 26. 26 um, of the Confession. Um, so we'll uh, start off reading, up, reading out the uh, Confession, do a brief overview, and then from there go on to uh, the biblical testimony regarding what the Confession says. So that chapter 26... Um, par and, uh, paragraph 9, 10, 11. Um, Joe, you can start us off with paragraph 9. The way appointed by Christ for the calling of any person fitted and gifted by the Holy Spirit unto the office of bishop or elder in a church is that he be chosen thereunto by the common suffrage of the church itself and solemnly set apart by fasting and prayer with the imposition of hands of the eldership of the church. If there be any before constituted therein, and of a deacon that he be chosen by the by the like suffrage and set apart by prayer and the like imposition of hands. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we see in this uh, paragraph there's at least four main ideas that are brought out. Um, the first is that um, that this uh, the way that you know elders and deacons should be chosen is something that Christ has decided, uh, which again reemphasizes the fact that. Christ is Lord of the church, and that since he is the Lord of the church, he's the Savior of the church, he's the priest of the church, and our prophet and our king, he um, can decide on how it should be done. And it, it is uh, not an arbitrary selection, but it's also based on the reality of the Christian life, which we'll get to a little bit later. Um, the second main point that's brought out is that it's by common suffrage, or uh, common voting. Um, um, Third point is that uh, that the elders and deacons are to uh, be well. Yeah, I guess it makes sense. Um, that should, they should be set apart by fasting, um, prayer, and the laying on hands, and um, and that both both um, this process is similarly for deacons as well, um, except for the fasting part. That's um, at least there's no. Um, no text associated with choosing a deacon is associated with fasting. Um, not that it's not that you can't do it, but at least there's no requirement of it. Um, is there any um, questions about what paragraph nine says? Maybe a word it uses. Um, well, we saw common suffering. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, we had fun of that two weeks ago. <coughs> Does is the imposition of hands like? What does that imply? As in, like, like, it means like like laying on hands. Or I just mean like, because I I mean in some denominations it's like they they. Okay, I see. So you're asking yeah. like, what does that mean? Okay. In a Baptist setting. Yeah. So within the Baptist uh, setting, at least in the more, uh, I guess you can say the uh, what's the word? Sensational model of yeah. Baptist. Um, 
Uh, we, we don't believe, it, let's put it this way, it's not like with a, I'm going to choose a little more extreme example, it's not as if like the Roman Catholics where they believe there's a literal power in the person themselves that they're passing on. Because um, for example, the Roman Catholics, they believe that, let's, let's just use an example, let's say Joe and I were priests. Uh, <laughs> the Jesuits. Uh, uh, and I lay hands on him, I am literally have power that's being imparted into him, from myself to him, and that that power never leaves Joe. Yes? Um, if you two were both priests, you couldn't lay hands on him and impart power to him. Well, I, I'm, what I meant as in, like, if he were to... But I mean, as brother again. priests, that would be impossible in Catholic theology. Hmm. Just it, as a Catholic. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. I'm just... I think what he's saying is that he's a priest, he's about to be a priest. My, my point, yeah. maybe I yeah, misused yeah, the right, maybe uh, I used, misused... Are you um, talking about a con or even a consecrate? Like, because if you're going to be consecrated as a bishop, you need to have three bishops that, that consecrate you. Yeah, right. I may have misused the titles, but the basic idea is how there's the idea how there's an impartation of power. Whereas with the Baptist model, uh, we believe there is no... The person themselves have no impartation of power. What it, the main purpose, at least if I understood correctly, um, is a recognition of the church and by the elders that this person um, is being chosen out by the church. Sure. Um, and it's, and it's ma mainly also following the apostolic example because they did that, did that as well when they um, ordained their elders. Um, anything else you'd like to add, Pastor, to that? Or Yeah, it's much more than the joke that I was told by a professor. It's empty hands laid on empty heads. <laughs> You know, that's a joke, and people might think it's funny. But there, there is an actual conference of authority, but there's no conference of power. Mm -hmm. Now, I say conference of authority is probably more a reception of authority, being recognized as having the gifts and graces requisite for the ministry. And it's a formal impartation of the recognized authority that's being given to you to be a shepherd in Christ's church. Mm -hmm. In the case of Timothy, in, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, there was actually a gift laid, it, imposed by the laying on of hands, but that was in the apostolic church. There's no mm -hmm. spiritual gifts that are given by the imposition of hands. Mm -hmm. So yeah, hopefully that answers your... Yeah, I think that was pretty clear. Okay. Um... And, and, and the common suffrage, just want to go back to that. Mm -hmm. The elders that lay hands upon an elder to, to be uh, brought into the ministry is actually the church it, through the elder elders' hands that are being laid on there. It's common suffrage. The church recognizes by the Holy Spirit granting them unity in their decision that this is a gift that Christ is giving to the church. And the elders acting on behalf of the church by the, the, the symbolic laying on of hands, they're conferring authority in recognition that this person has the, the required gifts and graces for the ministry. That's what's going on there. Mm -hmm. And I suppose we're going to go to some texts that are going to show that right now. Yeah, yeah possibly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, any more questions or something like that? Okay. Um, then I guess we can go ahead and read paragraph 10. Which, Gordon, you are up. The work of pastors being constantly to attain the service of Christ in his churches, in the ministry of the word and prayer, with watching for their souls as they that must give an account to him. It is incumbent on the churches to whom they minister not only to give them all due respect, but also to communicate to them all their good things according to their ability, so as they may have a comfortable supply without being themselves entangled in secular affairs, and may also be capable of exercising hospitality towards others. And this is required by the law of nature and by the express order of our Lord Jesus who had ordained that day that preached the gospel should believe of the gospel. So we see uh, within this paragraph, there's a 
you know, there's a lot of things to bring out from it, but at least there's a couple of main ideas. First is that the paragraph first focuses on the work of the pastor, of the elder, and that is to attend, first of all, to attend the service of Christ, because as we have talked about in the past, I, even though Christ has ascended to the heaven, that doesn't mean he's now absent from us. He's still present with us spiritually, and that he works through means such as the elders. He, attend, he is the great shepherd working through his under-shepherds uh, to feed his flock. And that the service of the uh, pastors are found in three main areas, in the ministry of the word, so preaching, in the prayer, and of watching over the souls of the people. Um, and that the, the whole ministry of the elder, of pastor, is to be engulfed with this whole idea that everything they're doing, whether it is preaching the word, praying for the people, whether it's um, when they're, you know, talking for the people um, to in the case of church discipline or conviction of sin, rebuking, um, exhortation, all the other areas, that it is all for the watching of their souls. And that um, this is important because, uh, to stress, because such elders are going to give an account of their, what they have done to the great shepherd, to their great king. Um, and this then relates to the second area, and that is what I would call the work of the church. Um, and what I mean by that is that the confession, you know, if you look at it, like how much percentage-wise, most of the, this paragraph is spent on how the church su should support the elder. Um, and that is important because um, even, when you look, even when you look at the historical setting of the um, um, particular Baptists in the 1600s, um, they, they were, may, there was a situation where many, uh, at least a good amount of the pastors weren't able to be uh, fully supported by their church for various reasons. And one second, this, this closed out. Sorry about that. And that um, part, part, of the, part of this, um, and one reason why this part of the paragraph is there is to kind of help encourage and to make it a matter of not an option, but it should be, a, it's what you can call a matter of faith. <laughs> um, as in, um, if the church has the ability to, pay, uh, to support their elders, they should do it. Um, um, and with that, when a church has the ability to support uh, their elder, but refuses to do so, it is to their own detriment. Um, and as the confession make, points out, and part of the reason why is because then the elder has to then work. Um, not, that we're, not that having a side job is wrong, there's nothing wrong with that at all, but the fact that their focus is going to be split. They're not able, going, they're not able to, to give themselves fully to the ministry of the word, fully to prayer, and to be fully watching over the souls of the people in a way that they could have if the church did support them. Um, uh, and, uh, and, you know, the history of you know, the church shows this in many cases where, um, you know, when the church does refuse to support the elders, when they can, I, I, emphasize, I emphasize that when they can, um, those churches, you know, sadly, uh, um, you know, don't have the best, I, I shouldn't say that, but they don't have the advantage as they could have. Um, I mean, I'm pretty sure all of us, um, you know, have experience, you know, all of us have been to school, right? <coughs> At least once in our life? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, that one time. Yeah, that one time, right? <laughs> but like, you know, if you're doing, for example, college and work, you know that, you know, your mind is like split in different directions every single day because you're focusing on, okay, I need to do doing schooling, but then I also have work. Uh, I mean, I was just talking to uh, Anthony um, earlier today, and he was talking about how, like, because of the change of the job schedules, um, and now he's starting schooling, that, like, for the first two weeks, his head was, like, all over the place. And now it's a little bit more settled, but still, like, there's a constant, you know, like, change of minds and not able to focus on everything as, like, he would like to. How much more than for the pastor who has to watch not over what you would call secular affairs, but over spiritual affairs, over the souls of men and women. Um, so, like, when the church is able to support the elders, um, it is good because then it is to the benefit of the church. Um, and that it should be done so graciously, with a charitable spirit. Um, that is very key. Um, you know, how many churches have splits or 
have fallen or had had issues because the people in the church, you know, begrudgingly, you know, took the money from their, you know, the dollars in the money, the checks from their, you know, wallets, and they're, you know, they're holding on to it. <laughs> they had to, they had to, you know, kind of pull it out, and not literally, but, you know, I say that kind of jokingly, but like, you know, they do it with a meaningful spirit. They don't want, they're like, why should my pastor get paid? I'm talking about, we're talking about good elders who are doing their work, not those who are, you know, not doing the work that they're supposed to. Um, so, so there's two sides to this, that elders should be paid, but it also should be done so in a gracious spirit. That makes sense, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else that someone would like to add? Something they read, like, notice from the confession what it says, or? Okay. With that, then, if we can go to paragraph uh, 11. A very short one. <laughs> Although it be incumbent on the bishops or pastors of the churches to be instant in preaching the word by way of office, yet the work of preaching the word is not peculiarly confined to them, but that others also gifted and fitted by the Holy Spirit for it and approved and called by the church may and ought to be performed, ought to perform it. Mm -hmm. So basically what this paragraph is addressing is the reality that um, it's not just those who are called to the ministry of elders who can preach, but if there are those within the church who have the ability to teach, who are full of the Spirit, as the Confession uses that language, um, that they can and should preach as well. Um, and that one reason why this is inserted here is because the reality that within, when you do look at you know, church history, um, even within some Baptist churches, um, there are cases where churches would say, well, these men, because they're not elders, they're not pastors, they can't preach. You know, they can't, you know, preach inside the church and they can't go out, you know, out to the street and preach the gospel. Um, and pretty much this confession is sort of like, um, how do you say, addressing that issue, the reality that, no, if men, if such men can preach, that they are uh, strong in the word, that they know what they're teaching, that they are good men, um, even though they may not be called to the ministry of the elders, they can still preach, and they should be encouraged to do so. Oh. Why is it only men can preach? Just out of curiosity. Uh, you mean within the church, or? Yeah, within the church. That's a good question. Um, well, I'll go into all the details, um, just because, for the sake of time, one, one of me, one, there are several reasons why. The main reason why is because in First Timothy, Do we want to turn yeah, let's let's turn to it. That's probably best yeah. instead of just quoting it yeah. um, to see the whole context. First Timothy chapter two, starting ver from verse, let's see, let's just start start from verse eight. We we'll just read it there. It says, "I desire then that in every place that men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarrelling. Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with with modesty and self control." not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she shall be saved through childbearing, if they continue in faith, love, holiness, and s with self-control. And if on there, then Paul then talks in the next chapter, in chapter 3, talks about how, uh, says this, The saying is trustworthy. If any one aspires to the office of the overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, nor a lover of money. And he goes on. Et cetera, et cetera. Hmm? Oh, I said et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. Um, the reason why I bring up that whole passage is because in chapter 3, um, you know, Paul is addressing, the, uh, is, is addressing the roles of the elders uh, within the church and then later the deacons. And he talks about how the elders ought to be able to teach. With that in mind, when we go back to chapter 2, so starting from verse 8 to the end of chapter 2, 
um, Paul is addressing the life within the church. And with that, then he says, when he gets to verse 11, uh, he says, then let a woman then learn quietly of all submissiveness. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. And that we see that um, basically what Paul is saying here is in pretty clear terms is that within the context of the life of the church, that, so that would include preaching, for example, um, that uh, Paul does not permit a woman to teach. And this isn't just Paul, you know, being, I'm speaking from his own authority, but he goes back to creation. Um, for, so, for example, just as um, marriage, I will use that as an example, um, marriage has its foundation in creation. God made man and woman, and male and female, and um, made them to be married together. Um, and Jesus uses that same, same, goes back to the creation event as well in regards to marriage. So when Paul is talking about how men are to teach, but not women within uh, the church, uh, that it is, has its foundation in the creation ordinance. So it isn't just some arbitrary choice of Paul or God um, through Paul, but rather it has its basis in who we are in general. Does that make sense? Yeah, sorry for getting you guys. Oh, no, th no, that's a good, it, it's a very, very important question. It's on the minds and lips of many people today. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel like you, your question, you got your question answered? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we can always talk about it, uh, yeah. more of it about later. Uh, we did, we did kind of talk, touch on the subject a little bit, uh, well, two Richard weeks ago. Well, and I were talking about it earlier. Okay. He wasn't sure exactly how to tell me about it without quoting it from the Bible, and he didn't have a Bible at hand. Oh, okay. So, so, so that I should ask you, I said, and that seemed like a good point to ask you. Mm-hmm. I appreciate that, Mitch. You said, I'm not going to try to say, I'm going to go straight to the scriptures. I don't have it. Yeah. But when we get it, we'll see it. Yeah, yeah. good job. But I will also say that probably at, at some point, um, the, the previous lecture, uh, the previous study will be online and available. And that's and that's pretty much delving exclusively into this topic. You, you'll probably just can just sh share it yeah, okay. through email or yeah. text yeah, or... Okay. Can I, I know we got to move on, but mm -hmm. can I make just one quick comment? The, pretty much what we're talking about here is that God's created men and we, women equal in terms of our, our value before God. But since we're created differently, like he created Adam different than Eve, he's created men differently than women, there are certain roles that God wants men to do, and there are certain roles that he wants women to do. And it doesn't mean that there's one's better or one's worse, it's just just different because that's the way God created us. So yeah. Just summing it up in about 10 seconds. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just like, I mean, easy, the most easy example is that, you know, God made females to be um, childbearing. Um, now, in the mod now, in the modern, <laughs> in the mo now, in the, obviously, in the modern world, we're kind of in a twisted situation where um, that's being literally twisted um, when you can get sur surgical implants and all that stuff. But in the, the way it's naturally done from the very beginning is that, you know, God made females to be able to chair build, um, chill, <laughs> chill builder? Uh, bear children. <laughs> sorry, tongue twisted. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, bear children and all these things. And yeah, like what Joe, what Joe pointed out is very important because, you know, it's easy to hear this and think, so does that mean that, you know, women are less um, worthy, less valuable in God's sight? No. Both are made, um, you know, to use the language, are made in the image of God. Right. Um, both are fully human. Not One's not less human than the other. But like Joe said, God made men for certain purposes and roles in life and women for other roles in life. Does that answer your question? It more than answers it. <laughs> more than answers it. <laughs> I, think we, I think we got it. Okay. <laughs> you, you're delving in the region of a theology class, but I like theology classes. So. Well, we, we all like theology here, so we're all in good hands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Liz, for your question and your conclusion. Yes. 
Well, um, I think at this point uh, we can move on to the um, biblical testimony um, and uh, look at some scripture passages regarding some of these things. And uh, the first couple passages, uh, the first set of passages we'll be looking at are related to um, paragraph 9. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. The, uh, in other words, how elders are to be appointed. Um, how, are they to be, how are they to be ordained in the church? So, if you have your Bible out, um, or turn on your Bible on your phone, either one, um, we can go to uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, evangelists uh -huh. the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to nurture manhood to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. Yep. In it. We can stop right there. Um, so as we can see, um, as Liz just read, um, Paul is talking about how he, referring to Christ, uh, when you look at the broader context, that he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and pastor teachers. Um, and that um, the reason why we go to this passage is to show, um, it's not the only passage, but it's just one of the more uh, easiest passages to go to, to show that Christ is the one who has given um, these men, uh, these roles and the men of those roles um, to the church, that it isn't some arbitrary, you know, it's not, it's not like, you know, the apostles, you know, got together and say, okay, we got to figure something out. Uh, we got to do something next. No, this is something that Christ, by the Spirit, led the church to see that they ought to have these roles. Um, and that there's a lot that can be said about that. But one, uh, there's a couple of things to draw from that. First is that uh, the office of the eldership comes from a divine source. Uh, kind of already said that, but just to summarize, it comes from a, a divine source. And with that, that means that, um, that the, uh, what was I going to say, the, uh, not position, but the uh, office of the, of the eldership um, is something unique. All Christians, you know, all who are true believers are part of the church. And yet, you know, not all serve in the same way. Um, and therefore, because it is a unique office in the church, there are certain unique, well, yeah, I guess that's the right phrasing, um, certain qualifications that had to be met in order to be an elder. Um, you know, if you guys remember, um, let's see, I think two weeks ago? Is last time I taught, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, we kind of talked about how, um, um, kind of what uh, um, related to what uh, Liz was asking, but in a much lar longer lesson, <laughs> a much longer lesson about the question about um, uh, the roles of um, women in, um, and men in the church. And at one point, I think I said something about how like men are only um, God has ordained it so that only men can be elders in the church. And there's a qualification I'd like to add to that, um, um, and that is that not all men can be elders. It's qualified men who can be elders. And that's important because that means that you can't just, you know, throw a random, I was going to say Joe, a random man. <laughs> Way to get on the Joe train. <laughs> you can't just throw a random, um, you know, male on, onto the, onto the, uh, onto the um, office of being an elder and say, we have fulfilled our role. We have fulfilled, you know, that, um, uh, that goal. No, it has to be someone who is qualified for it. Uh, you know, if we, let's put it this way, you know, if, if, if for the, let's pick something simple. For the, something, if you want a governor, are you going to just gonna throw some, you know, random person up there um, and say, okay, get to work. 
At least hopefully we don't do that, right? <laughs> hopefully. Um, history has shown sometimes that does happen. But, um, uh, but you want someone who's qualified, who has a history of showing that they are a person who have, you know, for example, has responsibility, um, a, has the, le the leadership skills, um, and all of these other things, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And at least two right. people are listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, if, if that is true for, sec for the secular um, case, how much more for the spiritual case, uh, for the church? Uh, because you're dealing with the souls of men. You do not want someone who's going to be fooling around, who doesn't know what they're doing, not, uh, and, you know, cause a detriment to the soul of the church. Um, so, th so it's a high calling. Um, uh, it's a worthy, very um, special calling, a very worthy calling, but it's a very high calling at the same time. Before I move on, any questions about that? Okay. Well, with that said about the divine source, let's talk about some passages that regard related to the idea of uh, what paragraph 9 says, common suffrage. Our favorite word of the week <laughs> or a month. Um, <laughs> um, and there's a lot of passages that kind of touch on the idea. Um, we're going to go first. We're going to first go to, um, let's see. There's a lot of passages to choose from. It's like, which one do you go to? Uh, Matthew chapter 18. And it should be a um, passage hopefully familiar because we've gone to it a couple times in the past year or something like that. No. We went through this one not too long ago. Yeah. Matthew chapter, well, I'm on 18. Oops, wrong chapter. Chapter 18, verses 17 to 20. Uh, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by the Father in heaven. For where two or three gathered in my name, there I am I, among them. Mm -hmm. Now before we comment on this passage, we're going to read another passage. Um, and that is Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. I um, mean, Gorbin, you up? Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Pro Prochorus, and Nicanor, and uh, Timon, <laughs> Barbanus, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Uh, these they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of di the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Mm -hmm. Now, the reasons why we go to these two passages, there's many more that we go to, but at least these two passages, um, is because we see, with, uh, if you guys remember from, oh boy, many, at least two months ago, uh, uh, when we uh, were doing paragraph, I think five, I think uh, Nick was doing the, doing the lesson, five to seven, um, he kind of talked about how Christ has given the church the power um, to, to use the phrase, rule itself, the, independ the independency of the local church. Um, that um, Christ has given the local church all it is needs to um, run itself in a proper manner. Um, given it, to use a different language, it has given the church the power to, uh, to do what it needs to do. You guys kind of remember that? Okay. And uh, in, in Matthew chapter 18, one thing we see that, that, you know, Christ has given the church the authority to even excommunicate those um, from the local church, um, who, those who uh, remain unrepentant of their sins. And that uh, when we uh, look at Acts chapter 6 here, um, that's, uh, if you go to verse 6, Acts chapter 6, verse 6, 
is he, it says, these they set before the apostles. Question is, who's the they? The church. Um, when we come back to the begin, uh, earlier in the passage, it says, um, verse 2, it says, the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and saying, you know, everything knows the rest of the passage. So we see that um, the apostles gathered the whole church in Jerusalem and said that we have the situation and we need to um, address it, in which ended up forming the uh, diaconate. Um, and that, that the church chose these seven men and brought them before the apostles, which then they prayed and laid their hands. And then we see the result of that, that the word of God continued to increase in all these saints. Um, and so what we see, and there's all then the passage in 1 Corinthians 5, we won't go to it, but we're um, related to this whole idea of how the church has the power of what you call the power of voting, the power of suffrage. That if there's a situation going on, that the church has the authority um, to get together and to vote on the situation. Uh, to choose, uh, for example, when it comes to the, um, choosing a man, to, find, to see a man who they think is right for, uh, for ordination and bring them before the church so that they can be examined, prayed for, and fasting, and then they have their um, hands laid upon them and ordained to the ministry. Um, um, so, like that, so, the idea, so the idea of voting isn't some, like, something that comes from out of nowhere. It doesn't, it's, let's put it this way, it doesn't come from the enlightenment spirit of freedom, democracy, and... Um, um, I don't, what's the third? Independency. Yeah, yeah. Um, Republic. Republic, yes. Um, and all these things. Um, um, and all these things. But, I can't, but it has its roots in the, um, the biblical testimony of how the early church ran itself. Um, and, that's imp and that's important to uh, you know, emphasize because, um, you know, at times it can be easy to um, overreact against modern uh, tendencies of the Enlightenment, for example, of the overemphasis on freedom and everything else and kind of like scale back to the other extreme. But we gotta have a biblical balance of seeing how the church ought to be done. Um, so does that make sense? Yeah. You're talking about the independence of the local congregation. Yeah, and also the power to uh, of common suffrage and all these things. Right. Now the question then becomes, uh, I guess I'll bring it up. How much common suffrage do you need? How much common voting do you need? Uh, uh, the percentage. I'm not gonna touch that. <laughs> um, uh, various churches kind of have their own. Um, positions on it. Um, um, I do think the more the better, which makes sense, I guess. But like as in like, you know, if, it, if I don't think 66% is having that as the minimum is the best. Maybe higher is better, and depending on the church, but that's just my own position at least. Do you, when, are you talking specifically when someone's like voting in like a Pastor, or yeah, like at least needs to be two thirds of the church or something like that. I think more than two thirds is better, but that's that's my position based on just like kind of like not necessarily an exact, you know, obviously it doesn't say, yeah, exactly. That exactly this because there's no you know Bible passage that says it has to be you know 83.22 percent of the people, right. you know. Um, does our does our constitution have something on that? It does. What's the number? Well, it depends. Some votes are two-thirds, some are three-quarter. Okay. So that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh. Is, is that the same process? Like, if, if one um, group would have to, let's say, uh, release a, a pastor from their position, mm -hmm. would they have to vote on that then, too, I'm assuming? To vote to, like, okay, this pastor needs to be removed from his position? Yes. Yep. Yep. Our, our constitution addresses that. That very subject and with a specific percentage of vote to remove the man from the ministry. Mm -hmm. Does the man have a say in that? Like, does he get to defend? Oh, he's able to answer his accusers, yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's not like, it's not arbitrary where, you know, the church kind of gathers behind his back and say, okay, we're going to get rid of him. Well, what, we read, what we read in Matthew 18 would apply where, let's say, let's say there was a problem. You know, so the person, you'd bring it to him first. And if that doesn't work, then you'd, have, you'd bring a few more. And you'd go and you talk a second time. And if that doesn't work, then you bring the problem to the church. Yep, the whole and church. Hopefully it doesn't go that I far. Guess, I guess I was just confused because I had watched a Christian film recently about 
<coughs> situation of something happened in a church where everybody ganged up on the preacher and I didn't think that would actually like happen because it's not biblical because you have to go to the priest preacher like you said first right like mm -hmm. the pastor right try to resolve the issue that way mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. I like to think it, it works biblically, but often it doesn't, and churches yeah. are yeah, sadly. in trouble that, that don't follow the scriptural guidelines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sadly. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, biblically, yeah. it should be done the way. Sadly, you know, humans, because we still have remaining sin, and um, at times we let things go wild when they shouldn't. Um, we don't follow the biblical example. Um, but that's an excellent question. Yeah. Um, that's very, yeah, very important. Um, um, even for all of us here, you know, because, that, because like, because, I mean, as we've been praying for our second elder, you know, this is something we had to, you know, think about. Um, that we don't, that we don't just, you know, come to church, uh, um, last, last, uh, last, uh, what's the, what are the phrases? Um, um, Without a care, yeah, there you go. Uh, without a care, and then um, just you know, smart people working. Wait, yeah, <laughs> lackadaisically. La I can't I even. Care. I can't even say it. I don't it. have a care in the world, you know. Yeah. Just just skip, sk skipping, either. just skipping down the sidewalk. You know? Yeah. No worries. But we don't. You know, we don't want to like come to the church and be like have a careless yeah, attitude and to say, oh, you know, we'll just pick this person, you know, and then vote. It has to be done in a serious yeah. manner. Mm -hmm. Um, and all you these guys things. Have, like, um, in your church constitution, I guess, do you have like a specific like time or process that you like, 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 like let's just say I come to the church and I'm like, you know what, I think Nick should be a pastor. Like, <laughs> I don't know, I'm just saying as an mm -hmm. example, like is that how the process would start and then like you would like have a couple of other different, or maybe it would be more than just one person, maybe it would be a couple different people would be like, hey, well, actually, the process is going on right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. We, have, we have men that aspire toward the ministry. They're giving opportunities sure. uh, to, to minister and, and to see if God may be giving them as a gift to the church. Mm -hmm. And it, by common suffrage, the people have to recognize that God is giving this as a gift. The Holy Spirit will speak through the body and, and say, we believe that this man or that those men have these gifts and graces, and God is putting them before the church as a gift. Right, right. Okay. Don't we usually vote on that at our yearly business meeting as well? Well, what we do at our annual business meeting is we put out what's called an advisory nomination ballot. Yeah. So that all, and, and this can happen at any time during the year, but it's always done at that time. Okay. Where members of the church, we read the, the biblical qualifications for, from 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 mm -hmm. of elders and deacons and give a little exposition of that. And they pass out ballots with, which have on one side elder, the other side deacon with a couple of lines, and ask the, the brethren to, the, for their input. I ask the brethren for their input. Do you see anyone, uh, any man in the church that has these required gifts and graces that you believe uh, God is putting his hand on and raising him up as a potential gift to the church? And every year I, I get those advisory nomination ballots back. And, some are blank, and some have this man or that man in this office or that office. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that answers your question, Mitch. Yeah, I would say kind of. I was just like wondering if like you guys had like, or just like when you had that like season of prayer and fasting, because obviously you have the season of prayer and fasting for the pastors, and then you have a season of prayer for the deacons. Like mm -hmm. if like pastor, you'd be waiting for that season until it was like more known. Like let's just say Denny, Joe, Nick, or like let's just say, or someone was like one of them was potentially a gift to the church or was potentially going to be a minister over the church. If you'd be, I mean, obviously you're probably praying about it right now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean. So maybe you're already doing that. You're already fasting and praying over that. Probably I don't know. Well, certainly the closer we would get, as God would have His hand upon a man or men, and they're ministering in the church to the edification of the people. And there's an opportunity to, to bring a man in to the eldership. Uh, we would make that uh, an issue for fasting and prayer, but we don't have to wait until that moment. We sure, be right. doing it. And I think that was implied in your question. Yeah, but I, I think I think what you along the way. What you're getting at, Mitch, I think is you're saying because there may come a point, Pastor, where 
it may be ready for a man to be nominated but not elected, but there's a season in between those two steps, correct? Right, a man that may be nominated, he's not automatically going to be elected into the eldership. But there would be a more intentional period of evaluation and prayer, I guess, in that sense. Yeah, yeah, that would be right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A number of people have put their finger on a certain man saying, we believe that this one is raised up, and be, he'd be presented to the congregation for further consideration before he would be brought into the eldership by a common suffrage of the church. Sure. There would be a vote. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any, any, any more? Any other questions or comments? This is that, that you, yeah, it's very helpful, especially since you know the reality that we're facing in our church. Yes, too. Um, like, and so besides just having your guys's prayer meeting after the fellowship meal, meal. yeah, 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 the fellowship meal. Like, is that kind of considered your? like the time that like the church as a whole like is really or like I guess is it is it more so just kind of like because you guys like meet up as because I'm guessing most of the members are going to that prayer meeting you know mm -hmm. and so like then they they know you know and so they kind of just start like on their own kind of like praying over it and like so on and so forth as I just mean like kind of that holistic like church prayer how, how that maybe works more so is it just is it kind of like is that kind of the intentional portion of that like as the church is praying together is is that portion on sunday well you, or, you, i just yeah I'll just stop you right that yeah. one you've seen the prayer list that we hand out right and you see the the prayer requests that are regular yeah uh, for our church and one of them is is for a, a second elder oh sure yeah. it's not stated presently in those words we have men that are aspiring to the ministry Okay. And that, that's always a, a prayer request that's simmering under the surface. Sure. In the prayer meetings and in our private, you know, gatherings yeah. in our homes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Right. It would be a duty of the members to be yeah. praying about that. Inside the church and, and outside. Okay. And I think many of the members are praying about that. Oh, yeah. And, I'm, and I, in private, they are. Yeah. You know, so, which is a very good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because cool. yeah. we want the gifts of Christ, right? Mm-hmm. And we need to be praying. He delights to give good gifts to his church. Yeah, that's right. You have because you, you don't have because you don't ask. <laughs> yeah. In a very real sense, that's right. We need to be asking for those things. And if we don't ask, shame on us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Is it okay to move on to the next set of Texas? Mm -hmm. Okay. Texas. Yeah, whatever. Anyways. Um, this. <coughs> Um, do do um, just do make sure I at least don't go too much over time. Um, uh, we'll uh, skip com com some passages I have listed for uh, to kind of help detail some of this stuff. But they pretty much a lot of the stuff he said, you know, in these conversations, kind of helped flesh out some of the stuff already. So, um, but um, you know, so we've been talking so much about how we, you know, about the ordination of the elders and stuff like that. But what is the qualifications for the elder? Uh, we'll finally we'll. Now, finally, going to get to that. There is at least um, a good amount of qualifications. Um, I didn't number it down. I did letters, so uh, I just probably should have numbered it down. But anyways, um, we can go to uh, Titus chapter one. Um, so that will be you, Holly. Yep. Verses five to nine. This is why I left you in Crete so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine, and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Mm -hmm. So we see that, you know, Paul is writing to Titus and saying that this is the reason why I left you in Crete, to do, to do the following, to, or, uh, br to bring what remained into order and to appoint elders. And then Many of the qualifications are paralleled in First Timothy three, which we read earlier. Um, and just for the sake of time, um, we won't read over First uh, Timothy three. Um, 
But there are several qualifications, and by several I mean a lot, uh, qualifications given. Um, and, and these are kind of just like compiled from the above passages. Uh, first is that the, the, uh, the elder must be above reproach. Second, that they must be a husband or one wife. Um, third, that they may, must be sober-minded and disciplined. So they must have self-control in all these things, which is the fourth point, self-control. Uh, they must be respectable, um, hospitable. They must be able to teach and to instruct. They must not be a drunkard or um, addicted to too much wine. Um, not violent, but gentle. Not quarrelsome. Not to be arrogant and not to be quick-tempered, but the opposite of all of that. Not to be greedy. They must be able to manage their own house. Um, because if you can't manage your own house, then how are you going to manage the church? Um, you, you must be able to keep the children, your own children in order, which is related to managing your own house. Those are two connected ideas. Um, Paul, when he writes to Timothy, makes the point that the man should not be a recent convert. So it must be someone who's been in the faith for a good amount of time, who's stable, who is not, you know, in the process of, uh, you know, trying to, um, how do I phrase it, um, learning all the, you know, the doctrines of the, of, the, of the Bible, but knows the faith. That way they're not so easily swayed by various things from the world, especially by the temptations of the devil. Um, that must be well thought by outsiders, and they must be a lover of good, of everything that is good, upright, and holy. So there's a lot of stuff, right? Now, when you look at all these past, uh, look at all these qualifications, there's something that should be apparent to all of us, and that is that many of these qualifications apply to all Christians. All Christians, I mean, shouldn't we all be above reproach? Christ. Hopefully we are. Uh, if you're not, that's uh, that's troublesome. Uh, I mean, we're all we, all Christians are supposed to be self-controlling. You have to have self-control of yourself, right? You shouldn't be so easily, uh, um, you know, tempted by your own sins or by whatever else, right? Okay, right. Uh, you know, we shouldn't. Uh, no, you know, Christians shouldn't be known as violent people, right? But as gentle people, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, and all the other, uh, many other qualifications. Um, the reason why I point that out is because um, it's something that L. Martin in his pastoral theology classes points out, and it's very helpful. It's the fact that um, the pastors and elders is not as if they are a um, um, how do how do I phrase it? A uh, how does he phrase it? I, in the league of their own. <laughs> yeah, they're not like in their own league. They're like if they're, but it's not as if they're. It's not like they are what you'd call super Christians. Yeah, they haven't attained perfection. Yeah, they're not perfect. But those who are being considered for eldership, for, to be a pastor, ought to have these qualifications beyond, uh, even beyond what the normal Christian has. You know, so the elders should be even beyond above um, uh, reproach. And by that, obviously, and we're talking about true reproach, um, that, you know, an elder... Um, that person should be known as a person who is hospitable. Um, all Christians should be hospitable, but elders should especially be known to be hospitable, which, you know, considering whose house we're in, uh, we've, we've been experiencing that for many years at this point. Um, many moons. Many moons, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, Oh, yes. Um, it's, it says that his children are believers. So right, okay, so that's a, that's a translational... Um, thing. If you read, uh, I don't have the NASB pulled up right now. Um, what does it say? Well, here it says believers, children who believe. Oh, really? Yeah. The word pistos is translated in other places faithful. Doesn't necessarily mean I don't believe what Paul's saying. They have to be Christians. But they have to be orderly. They, yeah, they, the, the parents, the pastor in particular, has to rule his own home well. They must be um, well behaved. They can't be wild, hellion little kids. That's <laughs> objection. Because, yeah. you, you know, if you can't bring your own house under control, that's Paul's mm -hmm. point, yeah. especially in First Timothy 3, yeah. 
you know, if you can't rule your own, as the Puritans used to call it, your little church, your home, mm -hmm. how can you rule the large church, the body of Christ? Mm -hmm. And so the children, your ability to control your children is a very important consideration for how well you can control the church. Parents cannot grant their children saving faith. I nope. wish they could. Mm -hmm. But they need to raise them in such a way as their discipline and their example and their teaching is a conduit or a channel for God to pour His grace into it, should He choose, and save them from their sins. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And so, you know, these qualifications are listed in Titus 1 and in First Timothy 3. Um, which again, it's very practical because as we're thinking about, you know, elders for possible futures for uh, possible future possible future elders for the church. You know, these are things that ought to be taken into consideration. Um, does whoever's the man as well, he's going coming from within the church or from without? Um, you know, does he meet those qualifications in a way that we can, without doubt, um, you know, in, without hesitation, say, yeah. He's hospitable, yeah, he's respectable, yeah, he's able to teach, and, you know, so on. Um, uh, you know, I mean, so like, you know, if, you know, when, when, when we, you know, pray that, that prayer in the church and at homes, you know, we can be thinking about these qualifications. Um, and then when we're li and going through our daily church life and all these things, you know, thinking about, um, you know, do we see those qualifications in such persons? Um, so it's, you know, it's, uh, very important to um, take these passages in consideration, to not take it lightly. Um, and this is especially in light of what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Mm -hmm. And within the context of this passage, uh, Paul is writing to Timothy, and not just not just Timothy, but the churches that Timothy was involved in, and and all these things that they should not lay their hands, you know, quickly, um, hastily, as one translation puts it, on a man, um, so that they you know, may not partake the sins of others. And that's something. That's one reason why you know you know some people could ask you know, for example, about Reformed Baptist churches or any church that takes this call serious. Why are you so slow at this? You know, why can't you just pick up some random man or someone who really seems to fit the qualifications and, you know, move on? You know, that way you can have like 10 hundred elders if you wanted to. Um, um, an army of elders. <laughs> yeah, an army of elders. Um, and, the, but the reason, and part of the reason why, though, is because what Paul says here, it should not be done hastily. Um, because if we put a man who's not qualified to that office, it is to the detriment of the church. It is not obeying what Christ has set before us. Um, um, you know, we talk a lot about the regulative principle, you know, and Christ is the Lord of the church. And we talk, usually talk about it in the context of worship, but it applies just as well for, for, for the context of the office of the elder, eldership, that um, it's a serious thing. And we have to make sure that whoever we do put up, do put up, I mean, put on, um, put on votes, whatever. Put before the church. Put before the church. Thank you. Suffrage. <laughs> suffrage. <laughs> uh, not suffering, but suffrage. Yeah. Um, before the church, that we, that we can be sure this man meets the, the criteria, that this is the man that who Christ has built up, who he has been working on for our church. Um, which, is, I mean, which is why, again, you know, even in our church, you know, we're, we're you know, we're not rushing to you know the first man we see who seems to qualify, seems to be qualifying, and say you're on. Um, you know, and sadly, you know, there are churches, even from my own experience, that where you know, there's a person who comes, and you know, he may come two, three Sundays, and if the church decides, hey, you know, this guy seems to fit the bill. You know, he can preach. He got a, such a great attitude. You know, go down the list. We're gonna ordain him. And I've seen that blow up in a church's face before. Yeah, exactly. It's to their own detriment. Uh, because, even like, you know, we often say, you know, first impressions are important. But as you get to know the person more, you get to learn that oftentimes your first impressions are not what you thought. 
How long did you preach here before you came pastor? I preached for a year. Mm -hmm. And, wow. well, I preached every month for 2008, uh -huh. and I moved in 2009 and preached every week. Did I say every month before? Every week until November of 2009 before I was ordained. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. So yeah, that, so that's a practical, real example of making sure that this man is for our church. Thankfully, we're still here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, you guys aren't going anywhere. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. wow. You guys want to leave? We'll vote you back in. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Come back. <laughs> Common suffrage says that you're <laughs> on <unretired. laughs> um, um, You're not telling us, Pastor? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, that's, so that all makes sense, right? Any questions about that? or? Okay. Um, there's many other pastors we can go to re regarding that things. We can move on quickly. Um, that way, we won't be two hours. Um, um, if someone does have a question that comes up later, um, we can, uh, related to what we just discussed, we can always talk about it afterwards. Dinner. Yeah, during dinner. Um, so the next passage would be re regarding, the next set of passages would be relating to the work of the pastor, and this would be um, not too long. Um, well, we're at about an hour right now, Danny. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, we start about 20 after. Okay. Shall we stop now then, or? You know, if this next study is going to take us, you know, a half hour or 40 minutes, maybe we should just cut it off right here. Yeah. Uh, let, let's go for the common suffrage. <laughs> 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 oh. So just, just uh, te technically, what, what ones did we go through? We went through nine? Paragraph nine. Just paragraph nine. Yeah, because the last, last times was just on a side rabbit. Oh, okay. Yes. Yep. And Danny wasn't going long. There was a lot of profitable yeah. conversation. Yeah, oh, no. Right. Yeah, yeah. right. Why, don't, why don't we stop, in my opinion? Yeah, I mean, like, because this could be 30 minutes, and it could yeah. be one hour. Like, I could expand it. I could yeah. shrink it. So it all depends on how you guys want to do it. Why don't you take it. one more week, Danny, and you can finish up the way, the way you, I know you want to finish up. Okay. <laughs> Read this right, Nick's schedules again. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'm the one on deck. I'm putting myself behind here, so. Yeah. Do you, yeah. Do you guys each take a turn mm -hmm. at teaching this? Well, there's, there's Joe. Did I point at myself? <laughs> there's, there's me, <laughs> Joe. I teach it sometimes. <laughs> Denny teaches it sometimes. And yeah. Nick, Nick, who's not here, sometimes teaches yeah. it. Yeah. We, 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 ro we rotate. Yep. Teaching the study. That, that's nice. Mm -hmm. Coming from a teacher, I wish I had that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, then, by common suffrage, and I agree, I think it's better just to leave it for next time. That way, we don't have to rush through it. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll leave it for next time. Um, I'll end up a prayer, and we can continue the conversation. Our Lord God, I thank you for uh, this blessed Lord's Day that you give to us, that we could even uh, hear the preaching of Pastor Nutter about keeping your name holy, and not just with our lips, but in our hearts, in all of our lives, God. And Lord, how often do we fail in doing this? We pray and ask, Lord, that you may wash us in the blood of Christ, that you may cleanse us of these sins, and help us, Lord, that you may conform us to your image, that we may keep your name holy as it is truly perfect and truly holy. And we thank you, God, for these lessons that we can have today on, on the subject of the appointment of the elder, and Lord, just help us to take this uh, tru uh, truly serious as we cons are facing the reality of, uh, of wanting another elder, Lord. We have this great desire. And help us, Lord, to go to your word, and not just one time, but constantly meditating on what we should be looking for in an elder. That as we desire these things, that, you may, that we may go to your word, that we may have our desires properly uh, aligned to your word. And that... In due time, Lord, that you may help the whole church to see uh, who you have uh, uh, chosen to be an elder or elders in this church. And that you may help us, Lord, that in due time that we may have the same common thought, the same common belief that this man or these men are truly meant for this church to be elders. And that we may, in due time, vote with a great common suffrage, with great happy joy, 
that these um, men, along with Pastor Nutter, may continue to serve the church, to be a blessing to the church, to watch over our souls, to preach the word, to continue to pray for us, to convict us, to exhort us, and to uh, point us and lead us to Christ, that we may walk after His ways. And we pray and ask, Lord, that you may bless the rest of this Lord's Day, that we may keep it holy, bless our speech, bless our conversations and our questions and conversations that we will continue to have. And they may also later bless the food that we're going to partake, partake in later. Mm -hmm. And we pray and ask this in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen.